This is episode 240 of the Stem Cell Podcast, The Human Brain, with Dr. Sergio Pasca. Hey, everybody, we are Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge in stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Stem Cell Podcast, rate us and leave a review. We're always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have Dr. Sergio Pasca from Stanford University. He's here to talk about his research seeking to understand the rules that govern the assembly of the human brain and the molecular mechanisms that lead to neuropsychiatric disease. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights and stem cell news. That's coming right up. But first, as always, we're reminding our listeners about the ISSCR 2023 annual meeting taking place both virtually as well as in person in Boston, and we will be there. If you want to learn more about what you can expect from the meeting, check out our previous episode, ISSCR 2023. The future starts here with ISSCR CEO Keith Alm, President Haifan Lin, and Program Chair Dr. David Scadden. We're going to start off with a paper from Cell Stem Cell. And it's a topic that's very relevant to ISSCR because, you know, this area of study has definitely been covered at recent ISSCR uh, annual meetings. The title of this paper is Cynomologous Monkey Embryo Model Captures Gastrulation and Early Pregnancy. This is from the lab of Zen Lu over in China. So this is a, a paper that's really building off some of the work that Jun Wu has done, and Jun Wu has been a guest of the show not too long ago. And Dr. Wu, uh, he established these blastoids, these early embryo models of, of human development. And what they're doing here in this particular cell stem cell paper is taking that blastoid model into a non-human primate system. And did a they did a bunch of similar analyses to the human blastoids to actually validate that these non-human primate blastoids are legit. And so we can walk through the, the paper. Of course, Human stem cell derived blastoids have pretty similar morphology and cell lineages to normal blastocysts. That's the whole idea is, you know, replicating these early embryo structures from pluripotent stem cells. But their ability to actually investigate developmental potential is limited for obvious ethical reasons. You don't want to transplant these human blastoids into people, right? That's just ethically, we're not going to get to that point right now. But if you approach this in uh, non-human primates, perhaps you can get around and you know progress a little bit further down those developmental pathways and avoid some around some of those ethical concerns that you would find with a human blastocyst. So they derived synomologous monkey blastoids, which resemble blastocysts, you know, these synomologous monkey blastocysts in morphology and, and also in transcriptomics. And they derived these from naive embryonic stem cells from the synomologous monkeys. And a relatively similar protocol to what the, the Junwu group developed, as I mentioned. So these non-human primate blastoids develop to the embryonic disc and actually have structures of the yolk sac, the chorionic cavity, amnion cavity, primitive streak, all the standard developmental hallmarks that you would expect to see during early embryo development. And uh, they had a prolonged in vitro culture. They could grow them for an extended period of time. Um, they also looked at the primordial germ cells, gastrulating cells, the yolk sac, endoderm, three germ layers, and um, you know even blood st blood cell development in these blastoids. Uh, again, observing that through these single cell transcriptomics, a whole bunch of single cell analysis to to really validate these non human primate blastoids in this particular paper. But then the I think the big part of this, and the, I think the big reason why they actually did this study in the first place. It was the transplantation work. Okay, so they're able to transfer the synomologous monkey blastoids to actually surrogate primates and achieve pregnancies. Now, I don't think the pregnancies were carried to term, but they're able to demonstrate uh, appropriate progesterone levels, presence of early gestation sacs. So they're showing that perhaps these in vitro models of development, these you know non-human synomologous monkey blastoids, can indeed progress to an in vivo developmental analog and the analog of early pregnancy. So it's a useful system to actually further dissect primate embryonic development since, of course, you can't do this kind of work with human. And I think that is the big takeaway here. Yeah, this is a, a big story. Um, and I'm not trying to take away from the amazing amount of work and finesse that it took 
to get this to 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 you know be successful uh, to whatever degree. But uh, and, you know that's a bit of a, a lead up to. I, I, I don't want to take away. Again, I'm saying I don't want to take away. I'll say it a fourth time. I don't want to take away from the study, but I just wonder about uh, whether we needed to go here yet. And I, I, I'm, I'm acknowledging it's important. I'm glad it's been done. But again, the, the resources that it must have taken to do this are tremendous. It could only be done, I think, in China, where they have a really robust um, you know, monkey supply. I mean, it could be done in a lot of places, but I think it fits that it was done in China. Um, and you know, my real question here is if we if we haven't and you said like they didn't let the pregnancies go to term. It's not they didn't let them. They didn't progress uh, beyond implantation, which is, I think, what most people would expect looking from the Rebron data from early days when you're transplanting the mouse uh, analogs or synthetic embryos and showing that you can't get an implantation and and, you know, deciduous development, et cetera, but ordered embryo development in vivo uh, in an actual, you know, gestational sac. We, we can't get that to work in mouse. So not surprising that it hasn't worked um, in monkey. And as you said, this is really a, a surrogate for human because we obviously can't do this in human. I don't think we ever will or should. Um, but uh, again, I'm, I just I feel like we got to we got to figure out how to get order development in a, in, a, in a less expensive system like the mouse. And I'm really waiting for that paper to come out when we get a synthetic embryo and a live birth. Um, and I think it may be a while. I mean, this field has moved super fast. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if it happened within a year. But I think there's still a bit of a ways to go, uh, judging from from what, what's been done so far in, in the mouse system. And you can do a lot of RNA-seq and single cell and all that stuff and show that at the cellular level, these things are analogous. But I think getting ordered development from a synthetic embryo is going to be a major challenge. And I think we're very far away from doing it in a, in a primate. Uh, um, so let's see what happens. But again, fifth time, not taken away from this study, amazing amount of work and a, a great group here. And I think a lot of people have been looking to this study and waiting for it. And now it's done. And, and we know that we're pretty much on the precipice of being able to make synthetic embryos from primate cells, uh, human even. And, and model some of these really fascinating and black box type concepts. So I love the story. Uh, I just, I feel like it's maybe a little bit cart before the horse. Say for the sixth time, not taking away from the work, not taking away from it. But I agree with you. I think it's, um, you know, it, there's still definitely a lot of limitations here. There's a lot of work that has to happen to push the field forward. But it's, I think, the big reason why it's in cell stem cells, just because it's such a hot area of study right now, these early embryo models. I mean, blastoids, synthetic embryos. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, if there's one area that I had to devote my career to and I was an early stem cell biologist, it would be this area, early reproductive mammalian biology, just because these model systems are just unbelievable right now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and again, I'll say, well, I'm not going to say what I've been saying, but I would be looking forward to now see when are we going to get the roller culture of primate? You know, it's kind of like you can, you can, you can expect all these things to come forth just because, yeah, like you said, it's very high profile when you go into the primate, it's just short of human. So yeah, I expect to see more in primate. I just um, would love to see uh, an endpoint of complete development in the mouse first. I think that's going to be the real holy grail for uh, all this, you know, really fast moving field of synthetic uh, embryogenesis. Another really em emerging concept, well, fully emerged but uh, it's. I think the implications uh, of this concept are, are becoming more and more pervasive. Uh, what I'm talking about is clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, or CHIP. Okay, um, and this, you know, there's been a lot in literature over the last few years about CHIP as it relates to, you know, hematological malignancy, as you can imagine, but also cardiovascular disease risk. Um, that was kind of a, a, a paradigm shifting concept there from a few years ago. Here, we're extending that to liver disease. Okay, so chronic liver disease, you know, stats affects 30% of Americans, uh, of course, mostly of older age. Um, and what it is, it's an inflammatory and fibrotic process that as a result of an initial insult, um, oftentimes alcohol consumption, excessive alcohol consumption or obesity or 
sometimes viral hepatitis, also a major cause of that initial insult liver inflammation. But that inflammation progresses along a spectrum from uh, fat accumulation to liver inflammation and, and what's called hepatocyte ballooning injury, also known as steatohepatitis, um, and then on to fibrosis and cirrhosis, that end stage liver failure, right? Uh, but the progression between those incremental stages is not really well understood. Um, but it's known that the inflammation and fibrosis are, are mediated, at least in part, by non-parenchymal cells, okay? So the endothelial cells, sinusoidal endothelium, also a lot of hematopoietic uh, cells, dendritic cells, lymphocytes, macrophages. Um, so there's a rationale there for, for the link between blood-derived inflammation and liver disease. Uh, and also... Uh, it's been shown in many systems that there's dysregulated inflammatory processes going on in, in the context of uh, CHIP, okay? Um, you get uh, expansion of hematopoietic cells in the context of CHIP that have these kind of precancerous somatic mutations, most frequently in uh, a few genes, DNMT3A, TET2, ASXL1. Um, and uh, CHIP is more common in older age, as you can imagine, and present in more than 10% of people over 70 years old. And I think those uh, numbers are still under you know, consideration. I think that number is expanding as, as the resolution of our analysis increases. Um, and CHIP, of course, is uh, associated with future risk of hematological malignancy, but also associated with all-cause mortality, and as I alluded to earlier, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So in this study, which is a Nature article from a massive uh, working group, the NHLBI Top Med Hematology Working Group, which is comprised of, it's at the end of the paper, they list them, over 400 investigators. Um, but this work was led by Benjamin Ebert and Pradeep Natarajan, uh, who are at the Broad Institute. And what they did was this massive uh, association study where they looked at uh, these four independent cohorts of, of whole ex uh, exome sequencing data from the Framingham Heart Study, Atherosclerosis Risk and Community Study, the UK Biobank, and the Mass Gen Brigham Biobank. So those four cohorts, they looked at chronic liver disease and it links to CHIP in 214,563 individuals. Um, and what they showed that CHIP was associated with an increased risk of chronic liver disease by a odds ratio twofold, uh, p-value less than 0 0.001. So this is a clear link. Um, and when you look at individuals that uh, have CHIP, they're more likely to show liver inflammation and uh, fibrosis as shown by MRI. Um, and here's the key here in, in this dietary model of non-alcoholic non steatohepatitis. Um, they transplanted mice with TET2 deficient hematopoietic cells. So TET2, often one of the genes that's um, lost in, in this in chip. And they transplanted those mice and showed that uh, they displayed more severe liver inflammation and fibrosis. Uh, and then mechanistically showed that this was mediated by the NLRP3 inflammasome and downstream inflammatory cytokines. So a direct link in this kind of epidemiological study, but then also going the extra mile and showing that in a transplant context with real cells in mice that they get this um, increased liver inflammation fibrosis. So I would say a, a very strong study that's expanding the scope of CHIP and inflammatory disease and, and kind of uh, multi-organ maladaptive stress um, in humans and real humans in a real population of more than 200,000 individuals. So I, I think this is a, a great study, a scary study with really broad implications. Arun, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's just another uh, milestone study and shows how important CHIP is in terms of contribution to various types of diseases. I mean, we've you know, there's been a known link between chip and heart disease, cancer and chronic liver disease. It makes me wonder if we should 
be doing screening for for chip you know like as part of your routine checkup it seems like a very strong association here but i i also agree with you in that the real strength of this study is is twofold one is this huge huge data set that they had with in collaboration with over 400 investigators like you mentioned also led by Pradeep Natarajan who is uh, at the Broad like you mentioned and he's kind of one of the disciples of say Katharisen who's also a, a very powerful figure in the area of cardiovascular genetics this is a huge data set for one you know originating also from the Framingham Heart Study which has been such a valuable data set but also the second part of it which is I think equally strong is the mouse model and actually Actually demonstrating that yes, you know, if in a mouse model of chip, there's actually an enhanced liver inflammation and those phenotypes as well. So I agree with you, just a very, very strong overall study, very worthy of definitely being in nature. And uh again, makes me wonder if we should be doing some screening for chip in uh in a more common way. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And I think that, that there's a lot of people uh trying to drive that into common practice as i said you know the association between chip and all cause mortality is undeniable and you know you got to wonder about what kind of downstream organs are maybe targeted by this kind of systemic uh inflammatory process so um yeah I, I don't know how that's how practical it is to screen everybody for chip but with the increased resolution and and cheaper means of analysis i feel like it it goes without saying that that screening for chip is going to be routine um for you know any kind of ge general uh medical counsel so uh, an interesting study that's adding to the weight uh, of evidence uh between linking chip to a lot of bad stuff and as i said pretty scary um hopefully we can find a means of mitigating that systemic inflammation you know with these people walking around with chip it doesn't really seem to be a means they're just counting the clock until the the maladaptive organ dysfunction takes root so yeah as you said a, an important study and a, a lot of implications yeah, it seems like almost like a ticking time bomb, right? You have so many other downstream impacts of CHIP and one of them potentially being cardiovascular disease, which is the topic of the, the third paper in the roundup that we have here. It's another cell stem cell paper. Actually, you know, we discussed this with Chuck Murray when he was on the the show not too long ago. I think it was one of the ISCR episodes from a couple of years ago when they're really trying to flesh out this work. And he actually really nicely laid out what they're doing in the study. So definitely take a listen to the that particular episode for for some more insight into this particular work. And here they are, you know, a few years later, ultimately publishing this paper in Cell Stem Cell Gene Editing to Prevent Ventricular Arrhythmias associated with cardiomyocyte cell therapy. This is what Chuck Murray has been working on for a very long time now. He's one of the gurus of stem cell derived cardiomyocytes in, in the field and a and a, you know somebody who I look up to definitely. A few years ago they published this paper using non-human primate ESC derived cardiomyocytes and transplanting them into uh, non-human primates for the purposes of cell therapy after heart attacks, after myocardial infarction. But the big limitation there was engraftment arrhythmia. So the, the stem cell derived heart cells that they actually put into the non-human primates, they they integrated, but they their rhythms were off. And that's a, obviously a huge problem because arrhythmias are very serious and they can ultimately lead to death if uncontrolled. So they've done just a ridiculous amount of work to try to fix that problem. And this is kind of the culmination of, of that particular work. So, and, you know, we've mentioned this a million times, human iPSC and pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes are promising cell therapy for MI, but you have these issues of ventricular arrhythmias that I talked about, which the Murray lab published on not too long ago, a few years ago. And they're using gene editing as a way to custom derive and customize pluripotent stem cells so that they do not induce those arrhythmias once they're derived into cardiomyocytes and differentiated into cardiomyocytes. And in particular, these engraftment arrhythmias is what they're trying to eliminate to improve their potential for clinical applications for these pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. They hypothesize that the engraftment arrhythmias actually result from pacemaker activity of the pluripotent stem cell cardiomyocytes. Um, associated with their developmental immaturity, okay? They're developmentally immature, and we know this. Like, I I harped on this a lot on the show that these pluripotent stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes are nowhere near the adult human phenotype, right? So what they did here 
is they characterized ion channel expression patterns of uh, of human pluripotent stem cell cardiomyocytes during maturation um, of the the cells and actually use a bunch of gene editing, triple gene editing, I believe either three or four different genes, four actually, that they modified to reduce the incidence of uh, engraftment arrhythmias. All right, so the genes that they modified were known depolarization associated genes, genes that are important with cardiac conduction and making the, the cell, the electrophysiology of the cell proper. These are HCN4, CACNA1, uh, SLC8, A1, and also actually overexpressing a hyperpolarization associated gene, KCNJ2. And ultimately, what this is doing is this making this quad edited IPS line, or sorry, pluripotent stem cell line, and creating pluripotent stem cell cardiomyocytes that actually lack automaticity in their firing but contract when are externally stimulated. So this is perfect because you can transplant these human pluripotent stem cell cardiomyocytes into uh, an in vivo system, and they'll hopefully sync up better with the, the native heart architecture, okay? And that's what they did. When they transplanted these in vivo, the cells engrafted and coupled electromechanically with the host cardiomyocytes. This was actually in a pig model, okay? So HPSCs, human pluripotent stem cell cardiomyocytes into a pig model. And the key takeaway of the study, they did not cause the sustained early uh, engraftment arrhythmias. And this is great because this supports the hypothesis that these um, pluripotent stem cell cardiomyocytes, when they're customized, and the name of their customized cell line was Medusa, kind of a nice name there. When they're customized, they can eliminate that arrhythmia problem. And this is ultimately going to go towards cell therapy and human clinical trials, right? If this was the key, having the best pluripotent stem cell cardiomyocyte line to use for clinical therapy. And I think I think they've got it. So they're, that's the next step is to put these in people theoretically. Yeah, the next step. And it's been a long, long journey. I really have a lot of sympathy for you, my partner, and all the other uh, cardiomyocyte uh, biologists who, who focused on pluripotent stem cells because it's been such a challenge. I mean, the, the biggest, you know, upshot of, of stem cells, I think, arguably was the heart, right? An intractable condition with a huge unmet need and societal burden. And I think a lot of people thought it was going to be easier than it was, you know, 30 years ago approaching. Um, and it hasn't been, but I really admire uh, you, Arun, but also all the other researchers, specifically uh, Chuck Murray, who has, you know, been there from the beginning and keeps, you know, coming up against these obstacles and just, you know, mowing them down. Uh and this is another example of that. And I think that the whole, the arrhythmias was such a, a shot in the heart, uh, no pun intended, my apologies, but but for everyone, because it just didn't, it did seem like when we were so close, we can get them there, but it doesn't look like they're working, but here we go. Uh, another obstacle down and you said it, I think this is the, maybe the final um the final barrier to moving these into clinical trial and really testing whether they're effective. So um, my hat's off to the Murray group for, you know, continuing the grind. Uh, you guys were almost there. It's very exciting. Yeah, it's exciting. And dude, I'm purely in vitro. So I had nothing to do with this total shout out to the Murray group. They've been absolutely hammering, hammering away at this for decade plus now. And yeah, this is the culmination of their, their work. It's really exciting because honestly, for the longest time, I was very pessimistic about this subfield in, in cardiovascular biology and stem cell cardiovascular biology. I, I never thought we'd be able to get to this point where actually transplanting these uh, stem cell cardiomyocytes into people would become a reality just because there were so many limitations. And I always, and that's why I honestly, I decided to focus the work that I do in the in vitro because the in vitro applications are, they're there. They've already been there for drug screening, for disease modeling. And that's that's bona fide, that's established. But hey, that's why Chuck is Chuck. That's why he's doing what he's doing and why he's been doing it for a long time. And it's not just the, the Murray Lab. There's other groups around the world, in Germany, for example, uh, that are starting to develop patches from pluripotent stem cell cardiomyocytes and starting clinical trials, human clinical trials with these cells. 
Now, the efficacy is the next part of it, just to see how it's actually able to improve cardiac function after a human myocardial infarction. But we're there. That's the the beauty of this. We're finally there, and it's a and it's a, it's an exciting moment. Yeah, efficacy efficacy is the question, but at least now we can ask the question, right? And, and that's what's so exciting. And, and one more thing, Arun. I mean, I admire you no less for being an in vitro guy, perhaps <laughs> even more. Um, but yes, this has uh, been a long time coming, and uh, probably a, a lot of the rationale for uh, Murray moving to Santa where, you know, Santa Biotechnology, where he's moved to, I think, because uh, like a lot of other uh, principal investigators on the cusp of realizing these translational dreams, I think uh, there's a need to go into this big industrial apparatus to get it done. Uh, this is a segue to my next uh, paper, which is also from a researcher at Santa Biotechnology, Sonia Schrepper. Uh, this is a story uh, also led uh, by Tobias Deuce, um, who's at UCSF, uh, about hypoimmunity, okay? And this has been another big, big story um, in the effort to try and get some kind of off-the-shelf product uh, that, that can be applied broadly in, in patients. And this story is about diabetes, right? Uh, insulin, over a hundred years, we've been using insulin and it's great, right? Diabetes used to be fatal, type one, uh, but now it's this chronic manageable condition, but you know, it's still a pain in the ass. The continuous glucose monitoring, even with these wearable devices, they can provide this real-time feedback and inform treatment decisions. They can even have these closed loop systems um, where, you know, reads the glucose and then injects the insulin. But even with those you know, state-of-the-art devices, there's still delays in uh, subcutaneous glucose sensing and subsequently then insulin delivery, right? Um, and also, you know, the idea of having this daily self-management just across the board, it's its a pain. No one wants to have to deal with that, uh, which is the large part of the rationale for allogeneic islet transplantation, Um from cadavers, but also, of course, uh, IPS or ES-derived um, pancreatic islets is another huge target. That and the heart were probably one and two in terms of the major targets um, of, of pluripotent stem cells. Uh, and the other thing is with the 20-year the 20, 20 follow-up data, they've been doing allogeneic transplants for a long time, so they have these 20-year follow-ups. And it showed that the duration of, of the graft is not great, you know, around five years, between four and a half and six years. Um, and that's because there's a lot of challenges to the integration, right? You get a, a lot of loss of those islets from this instantaneous inflammatory reaction as soon as you get them in there. And then, of course, you got to have lifelong immunosuppression, which has its own side effects, including uh, toxicity of the beta cells and kidney toxicity, your you know, opportunistic infections you're vulnerable to, even cancer, right? So there's a lot of reasons that we want to, one, move away from glucose, but also try and get a better means of, of allogeneic islet transplantation or even ES-derived uh, islet transplantation. But this story is about allogeneic islet transplantation, and specifically how you can generate a hypoimmune primary human islet. Um, which is a heavy lift. You know, this isn't ES cells where they clone them and then differentiate them. They take primary human islets from patient in this story, engineer them with CRISPR to get rid of the class one and class two, and then uh, purify those cells um, by lack of the class one, class two, and then overexpress by Lenti the CD47, which is, you know, the don't eat me signal if, if you're in... in uh, California, you know all about CD47, specifically Stanford, UCSF. They love CD47 over there. In this case, they're using it to try and create a, a don't eat me signal um, in these islets. And that's what they did. They do all this engineering, purify the cells. Uh, it's a beautiful cover picture in science translational medicine because they have these four islets, uh, two of them wild type, two of them uh, hypoimmune, and they're stained with these markers that show how they lost the class one and they're expressing CD47, a beautiful cover. Um, and they show that these, they work, they survive, they engraft, uh, they ameliorate diabetes in these 
um, immunocompetent, and that's the key word here, immunocompetent um, humanized mice. Uh, and they, uh, these islets, they avoided this autoimmune killing. Um, and the, the key here also, as kind of a ripcord, they show that they could uh, you know, they weren't weren't killed by the immune system, but you could eliminate them quickly using this CD47 targeted antibody. So uh, I think this is a nice proof of principle showing that one, you can go all the way from primary human islet, uh, engineer the hell out of it, maintain its functionality, and then transplant, show it works. And then there's this kind of ripcord in terms of satisfying the FDA. I think this is all a run up to, yeah, sure doing the engineering for allogeneic from cadaveris islets. But really, I think Arun and I were talking before the show, I think Arun, you agree that this is a kind of a Trojan horse for hyperimmune IPS derived everything, um, which is a specialty of Santa biotechnology. I feel like it won't be long before we see hyperimmune IPS derived or uh, pluripotent cell derived islets um, going into first, you know, pigs, mice, uh, but ultimately, I think humans, I don't think it's going to be that long, Arun. This is amazing how fast we're moving. Yeah, so many amazing applications for this particular type of work in terms of the generating these hypoimmune cells. Like you said, this is really a focus of Sonia Shrepfer's lab and also the work at, at SANA. It's a big part of what they do. I agree with you. I think I, I was initially surprised that when I looked at this paper that it wasn't pluripotent stem cell derived. That's what I was expecting. And the other part of it is for primary cells, there's only a certain amount of time that you can expand primary cells and there's a limitation in terms of the supply and the source. So you have to go to pluripotent stem cell just because there's not enough of these things. And the engineering is just phenomenal here. I think CD47, like you've alluded to, if you're a stem cell biologist in California, you know what CD47 is. It's the, the don't eat me signal. I think they've done a great job at marketing CD47 to because the first thing I think of of CD47 is don't eat me. All right. And I feel like that's been drilled in my head since even grad school. Right. So good for good for those guys. But yeah, I, th I agree with you. The ripcord at the very end is really neat so that if you need to get rid of these cells, you can add this antibody and just wipe out the, the transplanted cells. So neat study. And inevitably, it's going to be shifting towards the pluripotent side of things. And we're probably going to cover that paper pretty soon. Can't wait. I mean, that's going to be a game changer. And yeah, I, 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 again, I think this is, this was like a flex, really. It was like, look at how we can engineer these cells in a short window and get them back into a living system. Um, if you can do it with primary material, I think it pretty much sets the stage for doing it with something that can be passaged forever in culture. Um, and with that final safety measure. So I'm sure the FDA perked up at that. Um, very exciting stuff, uh, and I think emblematic of all these stories are pretty emblematic about how fast the field is moving, how these new concepts are entering, um, and how we're really on the cusp of uh, kind of realizing all these translational dreams, um, and in no small part due to our guest today, Sergio Pasco. We're going to talk to you in a minute about the amazing horizons uh, that we're looking forward to for neural. Um, but before we get there, I have a quick message from Stem Cell Technologies. The Stem Cell Technologies Stem Selfie Contest is back. Enter your best cell image by April 20th for a chance to win a Stem Selfie prize package, which includes a magnetic puzzle of your image. Visit www.stemcell.com slash stemselfie2023 to find out more about the contest and to enter. And don't forget that voting starts on May 1st. All right, everybody. Today on the show, we have a very special guest and friend of the podcast, Dr. Sergio Pasca, who is the Kenneth T. Norris Jr. Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, also the Bonnie Witengu and family director of the Stanford Brain Organogenesis Program. That's, of course, at Stanford University. Dr. Pasca's laboratory at Stanford University seeks to understand the rules that govern the assembly of the human brain and the molecular mechanisms that lead to neuropsychiatric disease. To achieve this, the laboratory has pioneered and applied neural organoid and assembloid technologies to make discoveries in fundamental and clinical neuroscience. Sergio, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. 
Thank you so much for having me again. Yeah, great to have you back here on the show, Sergio. I mean, we love highlighting the amazing work that you're doing these days in studying neurodevelopment and disease with some super cool model systems like Dale mentioned, cortical organoids, assembloids, all sort of IPS and mouse models. I mean, the productivity of your lab is pretty astounding as of late, I got to say. And the stem cell field and the neuroscience field definitely knows who you are at this point. But I mean, in case folks are still living under a rock, could you give us a recap of the focus of your lab and really kind of what you're focusing on today? Sure. I'm, uh, I'm a physician by training, and my interest has always been in understanding the molecular basis of neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, autism spectrum disorder in particular, which remain my main um, um, line of expertise. Um, but of course, as you already know, the main challenge that we've been having in trying to understand these conditions is the lack of access to functional tissue from patients. And so for the past, uh, well, I guess like almost 15 years or so, uh, I've been preoccupied with trying to build human cellular models, um, for the human brain and then apply them to study genetic forms of disorders. And that started like very early on with making neurons from uh, patients uh, with genetic forms of autism. And then, you know, we've been developing uh, uh, um, organoids that are guided in their differentiation. Uh, then we worked on trying to build circuits and then more recently trying to build some of those circuits in living systems. So it's been really, it's been really an exciting uh, journey, I must say. All right. For our listeners, I've got to draw attention to the TED Talk you gave in Vancouver about a year ago now. It's approaching 2 million views. So, I mean, a lot of the listeners probably already seen it. But, you know, TED Talk, totally different animal from your typical scientific talk. You've got to render your science in a way that captures the imagination and inspires the audience here, an audience approaching 2 million people. Um but in your specialty in particular, there's a bit of a minefield to navigate between the science and ethics, you know, and inspiring, but not over promising or oversimplifying. And you really nailed it, in my opinion. You had the audience fully engaged and it ended with a standing ovation, all while carefully laying out the realities and boundaries that we're all paying such close attention to. As someone who's taken on, perhaps not your choice, but it's it's your job now taking on this highly visible role interfacing with the public, what's the most important message that you try to convey? Also, the visibility kind of makes you a target, right? Even though the embryo destruction debate has been put to rest virtually, uh, do you meet any resistance, ideological or otherwise, to your work? Well, to be honest, my goal has really been to uh, tell both the scientific community but beyond that the science is already sufficiently exciting uh, that we don't really need to exaggerate in any way. There's there's no need to hype any of these aspects of the work. It's already exciting that we can make, you know, human neurons that we can build some minimal circuits of the human brain and we can apply them to disease. I I don't think we need to start attributing, um, you know, advanced cognitive function to some of these cultures in a dish in order to um, you know, impress or attract funding. And um, so I've been quite preoccupied both, of course, through the TED Talk, but even in the scientific community. And uh, I've been really fortunate to work with a, a large group uh, of pioneers in the field over the past year, year and a half, to try to, uh, I guess, simplify and clarify some of the terms that are used to describe some of this culture. There's been a lot of confusion and people have come up with various names, um, various acronyms. So we thought we should just like try to simplify it in a short paper, it's 1,500 words. And it's primarily targeted towards students and for those who are coming into the field and wanna catch up quickly on what has been done in the field. But it also outlines um, you know, a few words or a few things that probably should not be done. You know, I still feel very strongly that the term mini brain is inappropriate, uh, that is demeaning uh, to patients, and that it can be confusing for the public, and we should uh, avoid um, using it. And it may be appropriate for like the gut, and maybe appropriate for lungs, but for the brain in particular, it is not accurate because it's not an entire brain in miniature, um, and that creates a lot of confusion. Um, so yeah, absolutely, I do feel strongly, and that has come with you know, some issues for sure. Once it hit a few hundred views, 
um yeah but they started getting all kind of like weird emails and people are still not understanding truly what we can do and you can see from some of the comments uh that are put on youtube and otherwise but you know that, that you know that that this part i think of what needs to be done to um uh, explain the science to the broader public well, I mean, rule number one of posting a video on YouTube, Sergio, is never looking at the comment section. All right. It can be very de demoralizing, but hey, you know, it comes with the territory, right? You're working on super cool technologies. I mean, there's so many of these things that your lab are working on these days, including these assembloids that we've talked about a ton on here on the show, these multi-level platforms where you can combine different organoids from different brain regions or even from different tissue types to create this really next level representation of neurological function. I mean, I remember the cell paper that you had not too long ago about the cortical motor assembloids where you could stimulate the cortical neurons to control the motion of the skeletal muscle in this three-part assembloid. I mean, everybody knows about that. It's just wild. So, I mean, tell us about what's going on in your lab right now in the assembloid world. You know, what are you hoping to work on next for these cool pieces of technology? Yeah, well, I mean, we're certainly very excited about developing novel and novel tools, and we continue to build circuits. But at the end of the day, I think we need to apply them to gain insights into disease and hopefully into human development as well. And there, um, you know, on, on one hand, for sure, we've been building more circuits. And um, you'll see we just like actually posted on BioArchive a, um, an assembly for the thalamocortical uh, circuitry, which obviously is very important for many psychiatric disorders. Uh, but I think more importantly, an application looking at mutations in a T-type calcium channel, which um, where like gain of function mutations are associated with epilepsy, loss of function mutations are associated with schizophrenia. So we have for the first time the ability in this, you know, very simple uh, circuit to look at the consequences for this uh, genetic uh, conditions. But one of the, you know, uh, broader visions that I had for uh, building some of these assemblies is that they allow us now to gain access to stages of brain development. And then once we have this and we can scale this sufficiently, uh, we can start moving from doing one gene at a time to doing hundreds of, to looking at hundreds of genes at a time. So let me give you an example. Uh, for autism, going back to, I, I think, one of my primary interests, for in the autism field for a very long time, we've been discussing the excitation to inhibition uh, hypothesis or ratio of autism, where, you know, because patients have epilepsy and, uh, you know, because some of the animal models have suggested changes between um, glutamatergic and GABAergic neurons in the cortex, there has been this hypothesis that some of these genes are impacting somehow either the function of GABAergic cells or that circuitry. But the question is like, how many of those hundreds of genes that we now have associated with autism are actually impacting that? It, you know, it's in it's unconceivable to believe that all of them impact that. Autism is a highly heterogeneous condition. And, and one of our goals for the next decade, now that we have this long list of genes, will be to identify and classify them based on the cellular processes that they're impacting. And so we, we thought to do exactly that. And, and Shanling Meng, uh, you know, an absolutely superb postdoc in the lab, took precisely this task of building a CRISPR screen for the forebrain assemblies, which we published uh, five, six years ago, where we can look at the generation of these GABAergic cells and their migration into circuits. And Shanling has actually designed a screen where she could look at 400 plus autism genes to see which one of those actually impact with any of the stages. And you know this, uh, this project has a longer story because we, for a long time, we thought that it would be impossible, that the scale would be very difficult, that we wouldn't be able to implement CRISPR screening uh, for cellular migration in an assembly model. And I remember at one point, uh, we started making calculations to see how many assemblies would we actually need to look at all these genes to really have the power. And our calculation was that we would need at least 800. And so Shanling, to make sure, made a thousand uh, of these assemblies, and then literally took one by one, cut them in half, um, and did fact sorting onto the other side to see all the cells that have migrated and see exactly what guide RNAs for these genes. And she identified in the end that about 10% of these genes interfere with one of the stages. And some of those genes are, you know, complete surprises. Um, some of them are expected, but some of them were complete surprises. One of them is called Luna Park as a beautiful name for a structural gene of the endoplasmic reticulum. 
that causes a severe epileptic encephalopathy. And you may wonder, what does the ER have to do with internal migration? And that's exactly what we wonder too. Uh, but then by doing a number of studies, we've actually discovered that the ER has a very interesting dynamic during internal migration. Almost the entire ER moves in front of the nucleus when they undergo the nucleokinetic jumps. And in when patients have this mutation, they fail to, to, to do that translocation in front. And, and I think this illustrates the power of the screens that we can now do that because we have access to multiple stages of human brain development or to multiple, um, I guess, to multiple components of specific processes in human brain development, we can now start mapping disease genes onto these processes. And, you know, certainly day by day, we're gaining access to other and other processes. And I can envision that we will be able to do some of the screens uh, for other key cellular processes, for instance, synaptogenesis or, um, you know, establishing axonal connectivity moving forward. Wow. I mean, yeah, you talk about the the progress, the methods, the techniques, innovation. It's all moving so fast and opening up the world of possibilities, but somehow it all rests on the back of postdoc, our postdocs, grad students, trainees grinding through the night. So hats off to the real engine behind all this innovation. I'm glad you mentioned uh, that long suffering postdoc and, and her much, much deserved rewards there. But another thing, uh, you know, about organoids is, is they just, they literally brought the inquiry of human development to another dimension, right? Poor pun, but it's a reality. From monolayer cultures to 3D and the assembloids that you integrated there, I think revealed the high degree of complexity that can be modeled across the space of three, perhaps more tissue types. And you're just alluding to and mentioning specifically there the these these new screens and, and how CRISPR is integrating there. So yeah, everything's moving so fast. But um the the modeling in organoids has also been extended temporally, right? In time. And you were talking about all the different stages of development. Um and of course the developmental clock of organoids has a lot of rele relevance to maturation state and function, the ability of these systems to recapitulate degenerative or other disease pathologies. But there's also other questions that I think we're, we're kind of circling back on. When we're talking about neural tissue, there's other questions, right? When you have complex neural tissue chugging along for several years, in some cases, in a culture dish, you know, there's other questions. I don't think anybody who really understands the science, even at a superficial level, is worried about some, you know, unrecognized consciousness agonizing in the incubator. I think we all recognize that's that's hype and media sci-fi maybe. But you and other leaders have thought very deeply about these questions, however half-baked they may be, and convened formally, informally to discuss the potential questions related to the work that need to be discussed and considered. Uh, what are some real considerations, concerns, uh, that we need to be mindful of and and clearly communicate to the public when we're talking about these, you know, long-term organoid cultures. Is there anything uh, precarious there that you can think of? I mean, they're they're both surprising things and and disappointing things when it comes to some of these long-term cultures. And uh, you know, we've been doing, of course, a lot of work in trying to build specific regions or regionalized uh, uh, neural organoids that we can now keep, especially for the cortex, in principle, indefinitely in a dish. And indeed, we probably maintain the longest cultures that have ever been reported in a series. And in a series of three papers or so, we've looked at multiple levels to see how far do they actually progress in development. And so if you keep them for 600, 700 days or so, we've discovered that they pretty much progress at the same pace as they would progress in utero. And so if you map them onto human brain development, you see that as they approach nine to 10 months of keeping them in a dish, they gently transition into a postnatal signature, both at the chromatin, transcriptional level, methylation level. And you can even see canonical switches happening. So, uh, you know, for the neuroscientists in the audience, I'm sure they're very familiar with the NNBA receptor switch, where it is known that the 2B subunit is present prenatally, 2A is uh, present postnatally, and they pretty much cross around birth. And you look at the two subunits in organoids and cortical organoids that have been maintained for 800 days, and you see that they, you know, that 2B goes down and 2A goes up, and they pretty much meet that nine to 10 months of keeping them in a dish. And we've demonstrated that functionally, even through pharmacology and patch clamping, that that is really happening. So it's clear 
that there is an intrinsic program of maturation or of timing that is recapitulated in a dish. And that's remarkable. That's by all means remarkable. And we know that we cannot necessarily accelerate it. Even when you transplant some of these cultures, it won't move like much faster. It will still move. But I think we need to understand that there are a lot of limitations uh, to these cultures also. They are not vascularized. Uh, they're not receiving any input uh, from the outside. And that is incredibly important for uh, nervous system development, right? Just like think of classic experiments in neuroscience where if you cover the eyes of uh, a kitten, right? The cat will never see with, with, uh, with that eye ever uh, uh, afterwards, not because problems with the eyes, but because the cortex is not tuning to the information coming from that eye. Of course, you can do that later in a cat and it won't have the same consequence. So we now know that there are these critical periods in development where neurons need to receive the right information uh, in order to mature. And obviously we cannot provide that in a dish, nor can we, even if we put like five or six or seven brain regions, it will never really be to the same extent as it is in, in, in vivo. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why we think that in vitro models even when maintained for very long periods of time, you know, can recapitulate aspects of human brain development, but they won't recapitulate the, you know, ensemble properties uh, of, uh, of the system. In fact, that is one of the reasons why we've been exploring transplantation as well, because even if they keep track of timing, we've discovered that cells still don't reach their full potential. So for instance, cortical neurons don't have a resting member potential at minus 70. Uh, as they should be. They don't have, you know, dendrites as large as they should be. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why seven or eight years ago, we started doing transplantation studies in parallel to see whether we could discover uh, some of the programs behind that. And that's still like ongoing work. Um, now, I think there is a different set of ethical uh, questions when it comes to transplantation, right? Because there, now you suddenly have uh, issues of animal welfare, um, you have issues of uh, consent, uh, those who consented to give their cells and, and you know, what is actually being done. And then there are like very important issues of public perception. Uh, is it clear why those experiments are being done um, and how are they being done? And throughout most of these experiments, we've been very sensitive to these issues, both here through the Stanford Brain Organogenesis Program, which I lead, but also uh, outside of Stanford, uh, there have been several groups, some of them funded by the NIH, to specifically look at these questions as they're arising, not after, uh, you know, after the fact. And um, I think it's very important to know that we're thinking about the ethical and legal and societal implications as we are, you know, as we're planning the experiments and as we're doing the experiments, not just at the end. And I think it's important for the public to also know that um, as well. But we're not, generally, we're not necessarily concerned or concerns about um, you know advanced cognitive processes arising in some of the minimalistic cultures that we're building in a dish. I think just to make it clear. Yeah. So I mean, let's talk exactly about that next step. You know, the transplantation side of it. I mean, you alluded to it a little bit. I mean, that's a a big part of potentially driving forward the maturation. I mean, different people across the stem cell field, not just in neuroscience, are looking at this, looking at the importance of the in vivo niche and further maturing stem cell derived organoids of various tissue types. I mean, you had a nature paper not too long ago that was pretty wild. You could show that transplanted human cortical organoids do exhibit some signs of further maturation and engage host circuits and control behavior in a rodent model, right? I mean, circuit integration and behavior control is perhaps easier than ever, thanks to all these cool technologies that we're talking about, including optogenetics, actually. So, I mean, dive, you know, you've already expanded on it a little bit, but you know, keep going with this. Tell us what you think is the, really the next step for this work and in particular, how you can apply it to study human disease. I mean, that's what we're talking about here, right? There, I mean, there were really two motivations behind the transplantation study that we've we've published a few months ago. And, and, and exactly as you said, Arun, I mean, there have been a lot of efforts to transplant for more than three decades, uh, right? Then uh, Rusty Gage, PM Var uh, Pierre van der Hagen, uh, uh, have done like beautiful work uh, transplanting human neurons um, into animals. What we wanted to achieve was, was, was two things here. One was to see whether we could push maturation to, to, you know, in terms of cellular features to match more the timing that we thought the cells had. And the other thing, which was has been a preoccupation for me for a very long time, 
is that you know you can discover a lot of cellular phenotypes in vitro for human neurons all the time, but we don't know whether those phenotypes are going to be the same in an in vivo setting in a circuit. You can think of a thousand ways in which any of the cellular phenotypes can be compensated at the circuit level, and we've seen that in neuroscience multiple times. So uh, unless a cellular phenotype results in a circuit and behavioral dysfunction, ultimately that may not actually matter. And that becomes very important as we think about like which phenotypes to target therapeutically. And so we wanted to have both a platform that would allow us to advance the matur cell maturation of the cells, but at the same time to obtain for the first time behavioral and circuits readouts from the cells. And so to, to, to do this, we transplanted intact cortical organoids, and that's very important, intact, not a dissociation uh, culture, uh, but intact organoids as a unit in the somatosensory cortex of the rat. And also very importantly, we did this in the first week of life of the rat, because it's very well known that one of these critical periods that I was mentioning before closes at the end of that first week for the rat. And so for instance, if you make... If you take slices of cortex and thalamus from the rat and you try to put them together almost like an assembly, because people have been doing this experiment for a very long time with explants. If you were to put them together before P7, they would connect with each other, but you put them after P7 and they don't, or at least not in the same way. So the thalamus cares about the cortex up to a point and afterwards it doesn't. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to put the human cortex in the somatosensory cortex of the rat at a time when the thalamus of the rat still cares. And indeed, once you do that, we wanted to create a unit of human cortex uh, that gets certainly vascularized and it's positioned in a, predictable, in, a, in a predictable region of the brain so that you can actually leverage all these amazing tools that we have in neuroscience, meaning you know, calcium imaging, extracellular recordings, uh, optogenetic stimulation, behavioral readouts, but you have to have a, a chunk of cells in a very predictable position and in a predictable circuit. And that's exactly what we've uh, achieved. We've managed to build this cortical organoids that grow up to about a third of a rat hemisphere. Um, and you can do this bilaterally uh, and, and then use uh, those to start asking questions about circuits. And of course, by, by we, I mean, again, you know, I have three absolutely incredible uh, postdocs in the lab who have done this work. Uh, Omer Reva, who now has his uh, own lab, uh, back in Israel, um, and then Felicity Gore uh, together uh, with Kevin Kelly. So the three of them have really uh, led this multi-year um, effort. And the, what they have discovered is that now that you put it so early, the thalamus can actually send projections into the cortex. And rabies virus showed us that the main source of input is actually the thalamus. So now you can literally open the skull of the rat and look at the activity of human neurons, but move the whiskers on the opposite side of the rat and obtain responses of human cells. And that actually, we think, uh, gives more than just connectivity to the circuit, it actually matures the cells, brings them to another level. When we've done single cell gene expression, we actually found that layer specific identity was much better refined. We could literally find you know, cell types identified by the Allen Institute uh, in the adult, which would be very difficult to find in vitro. Um, and the cells would just grow about six to eight fold larger, resting memory potential sitting at minus 70 is closer to what you would expect. And indeed, when we model one uh, of these uh, disorders that we've been studying for a while, we've actually discovered phenotypes that are not present at rest in a dish, that we know are activity dependent and only show up in the context of this in vivo environment. And I think this illustrates that moving forward, some of this transplantation platform, which are certainly tedious and expensive, and you know, this transplantation lasts hundreds of days, uh, just to make it clear. Uh, but they have the potential of revealing both like new phenotypes, but also telling us which phenotypes are important. And the way I envision this being done ultimately is through behavioral assays. And that brings us to the last experiment in that uh, paper, uh, which certainly perhaps was the most controversial in terms of its implications where essentially we put an opsin uh, into the cortical organ before transplantation and this leveraging technology developed here at Stanford by my colleague, Carl Dyseroth, that essentially makes the neurons sensitive to blue light. They will spike once you shine blue light on them. We transplant them into the rat, waited for about 140 days, then put an optic fiber on top of the rat brain, right on top of the cortical uh, organoid and then started training the rat in a reward conditioning task. 
meaning that the raft is kept thirsty. And then every time, you know, water is delivered, uh, we also uh, deliver blue light uh, to associate so that slowly the rat will associate the liver of a reward with blue light stimulation of human neurons. And if you do this for about 14 days, in the 15th day, you can actually test them. And then pretty much you can stimulate in almost the majority of the trials. You can stimulate with blue light, but not with red light. You can use red light as a control, but only with blue light, you can actually have the rat go and uh, seek water um, uh, based on stimulation, which tells us that human neurons have now integrated into the circuitry and participate to the rat behavior. And as you can imagine, the potential for this is precisely in finally having behavioral readouts for some of these human uh, human cellular phenotypes. And just to remind you, all psychiatric disorders are behaviorally defined at the end of the day. Not, none of them have molecular hallmarks that are diagnostic in any way, unlike in neurology. Um, and, and so I think ultimately having circuit and cellular readouts for patient-derived cells will be essential in both validating as well as testing drugs for some of these conditions. Yeah, I mean, you boil it down there and it's so simple in terms of like the intent, right? And you're creating a system so you have a clear behavioral readout and then you can integrate all your genetic, you know, CRISPR screens, manipulations and and see and drug screening, everything. But I have to laugh because the way you introduce it as a typical neurobiologist, uh, neuroscientist is all you have to do is crack open the back of a rat skull. I mean, you make it sound so simple, but that's all it takes. But in reality, as you just uh, detailed, I mean, it's such a, a huge amount of work leading up to this point, decades really uh, of work, including that from Dyser Roth, destined to win the Nobel Prize, all integrated into this beautiful system. And I want to circle back to your, you know, raison d'etre here. You know, you're originally neuroscientist, neurobiologist, and and uh, interest in psychi psychiatric disorders, mental illness. Um, but, you know, on this show and in the stem cell field, when talking about cell-based therapy, much of the attention is focused on neurodegenerative conditions, right? And it's not a coincidence in the post-industrial populations around the world. They're all aging. Uh, and, and while there's like a spate of pharmacological approaches for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, pain, you know, immunomodulatory dysfunction, everything. Neurological disease has been a hard nut to crack, as, as you just said, right? Because it, it's all behavioral readouts. There's no molecular hallmarks, right? It's not really amenable to the systems we have. Um, but much more prevalent than neurodegenerative disease conditions and perhaps just as intractable as mental illness. One in five adults in the U.S., living with mental illness. So, you know, you've talked about some of the ways that we can model here with schizophrenia, autism, um, but specifically in terms of cell therapy, and maybe there there is no real appropriate cell therapy for mental illness, but is there anything, you know, everyone talks about in these meetings about the next phase where we're using cells to cure disease. Are there any cell-based approaches that can be deployed that you're aware of or can think of for treatment of, of any form of mental illness or psychiatric disorder? I, I think for neurological conditions, much more. Um, so you can think, of course, of Parkinson's disease where a specific cell type is missing. You can think of Huntington disease where another cell type in the striatum is missing. You can even think of like epilepsy where perhaps you could, uh, uh, you know, transplant uh, either neurons to dampen some of the electrical activity. But the reality is that for psychiatric disorders, we don't know what cell types are really missing. We wouldn't know where to put them or what to do. So I, 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 this is such early stages. We're so much far behind uh, when it comes in psychiatry. And, and, and you know, just like think about like, why, why do we have a neurology and a psychiatry today? Um, uh, you know, why have these two branches of medicine separated? Well, they primarily separated, uh, you know, beyond, of course, the political academic reasons. They have also separated because you know, some of these conditions, you could actually have a pathological hallmark, right? Like substantia nigra, you open up the brain and suddenly, you know, you don't see uh, uh, the black line pre present there. And that's probably causing Parkinson's disease. Same thing for Huntington disease and for many other conditions. Well, all the other conditions, autism, schizophrenia, uh, you know, anxieties, depression uh, are without a, a hallmark. And, and certainly we've discovered a lot of uh, uh, cellular changes in the brain, but none of them 
uh, are thought to uh, cause a specific disease. And especially when it comes to autism, autism is still a group of disorders. It's not one single condition. And um, so they, they have a common behavioral presentation or relatively common behavioral presentation. But at the end of the day, uh, this is a genetic, a highly genetic disorder that we're going to have to split into larger genetic uh, uh, groups and, and hopefully do that based on the pathological hallmarks of those conditions. So uh, until we do that, until we really understand which forms of autism perhaps are microglia related, which ones are related to interneuron dysfunction, um, and, and then perhaps device strategies where, you know, you can say perhaps we need like, you know, non-inflamed microglia to transplant or we need interneurons in the specific circuitry. But I think that is still, um, you know, we're still talking of, of, you know, relatively far future. I mean, definitely a lot of work that still has to happen here. And you've got your hands in pretty much every single field in neuroscience, it seems like, Sergio. And you've got your hands in like all sorts of fields in biomedical research in general. You're using all these different technologies. I mean, you even have a preprint right now in BioArchive using biocompatible polymers for scalable production of human cortical organoids. And you're doing some CRISPR screening as well in, in organoids and trying to find even like a periodic table of neurons, as you alluded to. I mean, there's so much that you're working on right now. And I think you are doing one thing that's been very beneficial for the field and using these preprint servers to actually upload a lot of your impress in, you know, work that's underway right now. So tell us about this kind of collaborative effort that you've got going on across Stanford, all these new papers that you have in the work, you know, really what's next and what's, what are you the most excited about kind of what's going on in your lab right now? Well, on one hand, for sure, on one hand, like in the lab, as I was mentioning, we're like quite systematically tackling the stages of human brain development, like from like trying to advance the maturation of the cells and understand the 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 timing, uh, how timing is actually uh, maintaining the cells to trying to build more complex circuits to actually try to make many cell types. I mean, the reality is that we can still make very few cells in the brain, right? There are hundreds and hundreds of cells in the brain that are inaccessible. Some of them primate specific or primate enriched, we would love to have some of those cells if we really understand some of what what, what one could say uniquely human psychiatric uh, conditions. And uh, that, that's why, for instance, we have an effort to try to make more systematically some of the cell types. Uh, you know, we, we jokingly refer to it as the periodic table uh, project in the lab because, uh, you know, we can certainly make parts of the nervous system, but they're just parts that we can just like simply not truly tackle. So we've been running larger and larger screens that allows us to make cell tests that we were not able to make before. Really inspired by, you know, I think everybody knows Mendeleev's approach who, you know, started initially with like 60, 63 or so elements and started to organize them and started to predict, uh, right? Because that's the beauty of the periodic table. Once you arrange them according to some rules, you can start to predict how to make uh, gallium, uh, right? That the gallium would actually exist. Um, and then slowly, slowly, we filled that, that entire periodic table. Well, I, I think similarly, um, you know, I think for the nervous system, you can envision that we can make some of the cell types. Uh, sometimes we can make part of the thalamus. Sometimes we can make part of the basal ganglia. But we can still not make a subthalamic uh, nucleus, which would be very important for some of the circuitry, right? So maybe perhaps as we're doing this larger and larger screen, we can start uh, extracting some of the rules for the cell specification across nervous system and make cell types that we would not be able to make. And, and this is work actually that uh, Neil Amin and Kevin Kelly in the lab have actually been pioneering and hopefully very soon we'll share some of the first uh, uh, work uh, uh, along these lines. But beyond just, uh, I think, generating some of the cell types, assembling them, I, I, for me, it's been very important to share this very, very broadly as much as we can. And we've you know, I can say now that we've helped more than 200 labs to implement the methods that we've been developing over the past few years. And we do this either one-on-one -on -one by having conversations, sharing free agents, sharing cell lines, but actually through some of the workshops that we've been organizing here as part of my stand for brain organogenesis. And it's a, you know, you should, you know, imagine it as like a very intense one-week course where student, we bring students from all over the world, usually 25 at a time. Um, they don't pay anything. There's not. They don't. There's no fee um, for this. Uh, there's no housing that they have to pay. They literally come here. We prepare for several months before, and imagine it. It's sort of like a Julia Child type of show, because we, you know, obviously these experiments are very long, so we have to prepare the components before, and then when they come here, they come and they learn the critical stages 
you know, how do you assemble them? How do you run an imaging experiment that it's 18 hours long? Uh, you know, what are the some of the variables or components that you should consider when you're doing an experimental design to make sure that it's sufficiently powered? And it, it's been incredibly empowering. And it, it's done actually with students in my lab. They're the ones that are actually doing all the heavy lifting. I mean, I just show up there uh, and, and talk to students, but they're the ones who, re who really do all the work. And I think this needs to be done uh, because as the community is growing, there's enough for everybody to do for a very, very long time. <laughs> there's, there's uh, right? I mean, for psychiatric disorders, we're talking about like, you know, another century of like doing hard work. We're not going to be around. And I think training the next generation of students in applying these techniques right away is very important. And you know, like a technique is a technique is only as good as it as it being used. And so our philosophy has always been to share it as quickly as we can with others and help them implement. Um, because again, there is enough to be done for a very long time. I love the way you communicate, man. The 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 use of metaphor is brilliant. You making gallium periodic table of of neurons you know talking about julia child in there i think that itself your your mode of communication is kind of a a metaphor for great science you know you got to borrow kind of the imagery and ideas from all kinds of different diverse ways of thinking and stanford for that you know as a rich collaborative environment with diverse thinkers as good as it gets uh, you further concentrated the diverse talents there into this Stanford Brain Organogenesis program that you lead, made up of yourself and six other PIs, if I have that right, including, as you said there, your collaborator, Carl Dyseroff, presumptive future Nobel Prize laureate. Also, though, Hank Greeley, Greeley amongst others, great scientists as well. But I, I was struck by Hank Greeley, lawyer and leading authority on ethical, legal and social implications of new biomedical technologies. And you know, talking to you here, it's pretty clear that he has a major role there in that panel. Um, but just explain to us, what's the primary uh, goal and impetus of the, the Stanford Brain Organogenesis Program? Also, uh, as someone who's skyrocketed to scientific godhood in a postdoctoral career that was spent pretty much entirely at Stanford, what is the unique quality or combination of qualities present there? Maybe Arun can speak to this too. What do they got there? What's the special sauce uh, that you think enabled your success that is really couldn't be replicated elsewhere? Yeah, well, I mean, the 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 way I envisioned and then built the program was to be a university wide program where we're actually bringing labs that have developed novel technology that could actually be applied to brain organoids and assemblies. That was really the vision behind it. And so if you look at every single one of the labs, they have pioneered like optogenetics and clearing methods, uh, Carl Dyseroth, or uh, you know flexible electronics such as Zhenan Bao and Bian Shao Tsui, uh, or voltage sensors like Michael Lin, or extracellular matrices uh, such as Sarah Henshaw. Each of them has actually developed a novel technology that we thought would be, uh, you know, will create more than the sum of its power when it was to be combined. And actually, uh, most of the work that we've done as a group has not even yet been published. I mean, you'll see very soon, hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll have uh, uh, some of the work that we've done on building uh, next generation uh, approaches to record in real time for very long periods of, uh, uh, of time and in uh, 3D, the electrical activity of organoids and assemblies, which is really coming out of this uh, collaborative effort. And of course, Hank is a professor of law and has expertise in ethics, has always been present there to discuss some of the implications of the work, especially as we were doing more and more transplantation work. But the second goal of the, the program is precisely to train others outside of Stanford University. Um, and I'm not sure. I mean, there are a lot of things that are uh, special about Stanford. There's no doubt about it. I think there is an openness uh, to trying new things. Uh, uh, and uh, people are like generally very collaborative and very diverse in their expertise. I think there's very little overlap in general. And I think that creates a ease in terms of like collaboration. Um, and uh, people have always been, I mean, I think Arun, maybe you can speak to this, but it, it's always been incredibly easy to set up collaboration to get students to work between labs. Uh, we attract some of the best students and I've been so fortunate in having some of the you know, amazing students. Uh, many of them now have their own labs um, uh, around the country. I think I mentioned a, a few of them, but 
you know, for instance, Fikri Bire, Jimena Anderson, who've been built the four brain assemblies, the corticospinal now to have their own labs at Emory. Chris Mackinson, who was like uh, working very early on on the electrophysiological recordings, now has his own lab at Columbia. I think it's, uh, you know, I've been incredibly fortunate to have a superb group of uh, uh, scientists who came to Stanford and thrived, I, I hope, uh, in, in this environment. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Sergio. It's that collaborative spirit that I think is in the DNA of Stanford and the university. I mean, you have multiple world-class departments at this one school that you can bike across within five minutes, right? And that collaborative spirit is encouraged at the graduate level. I mean, that's something that from day one, when I walked on the campus, I started getting involved in projects that were across the campus on the engineering school. And it's almost like something you're expected to do. And I've trained at a lot of different places. And I think Stanford has been the one place where that collaborative spirit, it, it, it it's really, really holds true. I've never been in a place like it. So that's what it's all about. Yeah, well, a, a bit of a plug for Stanford here, but also for the Brain Organogenesis Program. Uh, I think that's a really great way to consolidate the young talent and get everybody on, on the same page and also for your efforts to really create clear language uh, communication, you know, as a as a highly visible figure in the field, not just, I know maybe stem cells isn't your wheelhouse, but I'm afraid uh, it kind of is, Sergio. I mean, you're, you're icon in the field. We all look to you to come up with the greatest next innovations. And really, I think more now are as much uh, to be a communicator of um, what's important in the field and of course we on the podcast really value that facet of your effort and contribution and for sharing with us today thank you so much uh, we gotta have you on again very soon but it's been nice chatting with you here thank you so much for having me it was fun all right guys that brings us to the end of this episode don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or by email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. Until the next episode, thank you so much for listening.